Hi, this is Minister Joannides with the Optimum Academy, Diabetes 101, video number one, Introduction to Diabetes. So let's get started. So you can see here from a chart that uh, maps out, <clears throat> pardon me, fasting serum glucose versus the hazard ratio of that level of glucose. You can see that if you wanted to get to the lowest possible hazard ratio or lowest risk, you would want to be somewhere around 80 milligrams per deciliter. That's where the curve is actually at its lowest. And you can see that as glucose levels go up to the right, uh, you can notice that the hazard ratio also goes up. So the higher the glucose, the fasting serum glucose level, in milligrams per deciliter, the higher the hazard ratio. You can also notice that there is some upward movement in the curve at low glucoses. But today we're going to be talking about what happens with high glucoses and how does that affect the body. So when we talk about glucose, we want to talk about the foods that generate, you know, sugar, in the body or sugars that you take into the body. And we want to talk about high versus low glycemic foods. So what makes the glucose level spike? So if you eat high glycemic foods, the glucose level is going to spike like that red curve on this graph. And you can see that those are the foods that cause a high glycemic level. And it's things like chips, biscuits, cake, ice cream, dates, jasmine, rice, potatoes, processed food, watermelon, white bread. So those shoot your glucose level up. And below that, the gray curve are low glycemic foods. Basmati rice, vegetables, lentils, pasta, whole grain bread, oats, oranges. So if we wanted to reduce the spike in the glucose levels in our body, we want to eat those foods that limit the spike, like that gray curve at the bottom. And in reference here, I put the, the contrast of in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. There's that tall pointed uh, mountain called Sugarloaf, uh, which is kind of interesting since we're talking about glycemic foods. And that's kind of uh, the visual that compares to what we get with high glycemic food glucose spikes. And then you can see in front of that are some lower hills or mountains. And that's kind of what we're shooting for with lower glycemic foods. So you can see the contrast. And then at the bottom, uh, Christ is kind of overlooking the whole area. So keeping an eye on things. So in our body, we have the pancreas, which secretes insulin and glucagon to maintain homeostasis of sugars. And the pancreas, as you know, is kind of buried back in the retroperitoneal area. <clears throat> and within the organ are beta cells, which secrete insulin, and alpha cells, which secrete glucagon. So if we were to have a low glucose level, glucagon uh, production would be stimulated, and that would cause the blood sugar to go up. If we have a high glucose level in our blood, then that should trigger insulin release from the pancreas, and that should help bring our glucose level down. So these two balance each other out, hopefully, to maintain homeostasis and a normal glucose level in the body. Just enough for what we need, but hopefully not too much to cause problems. So what happens in pre-diabetes, since we're going to talk about diabetes today, what happens in pre-diabetes? So when we draw a blood sample, it needs to be centrifuged immediately 
Otherwise, the sugar level actually drops in the blood sample because of the red cells uh, consuming, you might say, the sugar. So uh, we wanna make sure that when a blood sample is drawn, it's centrifuged immediately. The longer it sits without being centrifuged, the lower the glucose level may be just from the blood sitting. So if somebody had an elevated blood sugar in their body, but the blood sample was left to sit for hours, the blood level, or the blood sugar level may actually be low, not due to anything but allowing the sample to have not been centrifuged immediately. A fasting blood sugar level less than 100 milligrams per deciliter is normal. A fasting blood sugar from 100 to 125 is considered prediabetes, and that would equate to an A1C of somewhere in the 5.7 to 6.4 range. Of course, there's a lot of people that are normal that have a 5.7 or 5.8, but this is what uh, is uh, you know, classically defined as prediabetes. Often an insurance applicant is unaware that their blood sugar or A1C is elevated until they apply for life insurance. The A1C is an indicator of blood sugar levels over the preceding 60 to 90 days. So it's kind of a long-term uh, reflection of what the blood sugar levels have been in the body. However, there's a caveat that obviously if you have an abnormal hemoglobin variant, or have hemolysis of red cells that may affect the hemoglobin levels and therefore also affect the A1C. So we're assuming here there's no abnormal hemoglobin variant when we're running these A1Cs. If you ever happen to see a super low A1C, it may be because there's a hemoglobin variant. So what happens with hemoglobin and RBCs and glucose in the body. So typical red blood cell has hemoglobin in it, and that hemoglobin attaches to glucose to form glycohemoglobin. So normally it's the, the A1C is in the normal range because there's not that much glucose to bind to the hemoglobin but a high A1C would give a reflection that there's extra glucose in the system and the A1C would be up. And you can see from the pictures that I've added of how to make caramel. So you start with sugar heated up and it turns to that really goopy, thick, sticky stuff. So if you can imagine, although we don't heat up glucose in our bodies higher than our normal body temperature, you can kind of get a feel for this goopy, gloppy stuff. Uh, probably doesn't help out anything in our bodies or the bloodstream, and it can have a negative inflammatory effect on the lining of blood vessels and all kinds of organ systems. So that's why high blood sugars are bad for the body. So what's the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus. So that would be an A1C greater than 6.5% or a fasting sugar higher than 126. You can also do two hour glucose test. Uh, and if it's higher than 200 during an oral glucose tolerance test, that would give you a diagnosis of diabetes random plasma glucose greater than 200. In a patient with classic symptoms of hyperglycemia, it gives you the diagnosis. And the mortality risk of diabetes increases as the A1C increases. If so if the high, if levels remain high, the risk uh, remains high as well. So elevated blood glucose is pro-inflammatory so it causes inflammation and disease in the vital organ systems of the body, the immune system, heart, kidneys, eyes, nerves, etc. So when we underwrite cases, not only do we 
check to see what the level of the A1C is, but are there any adverse effects uh, in the body in any of those uh, systems? So applicants for life insurance may not be aware that their hemoglobin A1C is elevated until they have blood testing for life insurance. So we actually provide a service. We may find people that otherwise were unaware that they had an elevated blood sugar, and if they get the results of their uh, lab tests when they applied for insurance, they can take it to their doctor and get further care if the A1C is elevated. Um, if a new diagnosis of type 2 diabetes is made during underwriting, if it's very high, uh, the A1C is very high, it may be prudent to wait until the applicant has been evaluated by a physician. However, sometimes we take you know, modestly elevated A1Cs, assuming that the correct things will happen in the future and they will get further care. So we rate them appropriately for whatever the level uh, the modest elevated level may be. Um, so how do we check for glucose levels if, after the diagnosis has been, a, been made, if medication is going to be needed? So uh, in the old days, everyone had to do lancets, stick their finger, and then test the blood for what the level of blood sugar was and whether they needed uh, additional treatment or not. However, now, uh, in addition to uh, that we have glucose monitoring devices. So probably at some time in the future, we'll all be wearing glucose monitoring devices because it will tell us when our glucose level spikes. But certainly for people that have diabetes, uh, this is a, a great invention that they can now monitor their blood sugar level without getting, uh, without sticking their finger, having blood drawn all the time. And the uh, continuous glucose monitoring devices, CGM, sorry, my picture is blocking out those three letters, but that's CGM device. You know, by putting that on your skin, um, it will give information to your phone or whatever to allow you to monitor your blood sugar levels uh, after you eat, exercise, take your medications, et cetera, and you'll know in which direction the blood sugar is heading, up or down. And um, you know if it gets too high, to seek further assistance from your doctor. Uh, if it gets too low, you may need to take something to bring it back to its normal level. So these are great inventions. And continuous glucose monitoring has really helped us uh, move in the right direction on following people that have elevated blood sugar. So. That completes our first uh, talk on diabetes. And I just wanted to mention at Optimum, you know, our, our uh, logo includes a nautilus shell. Uh, it's one of the oldest creatures to survive in the ocean. It's a symbol of nature's grace in growth, expansion, and renewal. A symbol of order amidst chaos as reflected in its spinal, spiral precision. So. Uh, look, look forward to seeing you in talk number two on diabetes.